Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate that. And um, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I'm going to uh, just say quickly, uh, Dr. Johanna Turner and myself will be hosting this. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Johanna to Turner to give a bit of a, an introduction and welcome. And then uh, I'll introduce our guests and go from there. Johanna? At the Center for Justice and Peace Building at Eastern Mennonite University and part of our resident center here, the Zaire Institute for Restorative Justice. So I want to welcome everyone to our webinar uh, today we're from wherever in the world you're coming from, whatever time it is where you are. Our topic today is restorative justice, restorative theology, restorative church. Over the past uh, couple of decades, we've seen greater cross-fertilization between restorative justice, restorative theology, and restorative church practices. And so the purpose of this conversation is to really encourage more of these crossover conversations. So a few guiding questions that we're exploring in our webinar today. One is, what are some of the, way, the ways in which theologians can benefit from more knowledge of restorative justice um, as a framework as well as specific practices? Another uh, area of cross-fertilization that we'll be exploring is in the realm of church practices. So church leaders, in what ways can church leaders foster kind of more uh, reconciliation practices in the church and how can they benefit from really learning restorative frameworks that they can use um, to do this within their churches? And what can restorative justice practitioners learn from restorative theology and what's happening within churches, especially in terms of addressing conflict and harm within churches. So I'm excited to welcome you to the webinar where we'll talk about this really fertile zone of sharing and blending. Um, we have some great guests today, which Carl is introducing, and we're really excited about all of you and the questions and comments that you'll have to contribute to our discussion. Great, thank you, Joanna. Let's go ahead and... Um... I'd love to introduce you to Ted Lewis and Chris Marshall, who will be um, taking us into the webinar series. And really, it'll be a discussion between them. And um, But in the process, I would just want to make sure you know who you're in conversation with. So we're really, really pleased to have Chris Marshall, who has been on some of our webinar series in the past, uh, back again. And Chris is coming from all the way from New Zealand, and uh, we appreciate him taking the time out of his busy schedule to be here. Chris is really a, a critical voice in, in the field and has been involved in the field of restorative justice for many years, has authored a number of books uh, that are very widely read and uh, important contributions to our work here. Chris is currently the holder of the Deanna Unwin Chair in Restorative Justice at Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. He's the author of six books and more than 100 articles, books, chapters, and reference work entries, many dealing with restorative justice and restorative theology. Some of you may know some of those books, Beyond Retribution, A New Testament, New Testament Vision for Justice, Crime, and Punishment. He has been a contributing author to our little book series, and his is on the little book of biblical justice in 2004. And most recently, um, The Compassionate Justice, an interdisciplinary dialogue with two gospel parables on crime and restorative justice from 2012. And if any of you've read some of those books, you know they're deep and insightful and have been important contributions. So we're really glad to have Chris with us. Welcome, Chris. Thank Ted you. Marshall, um, Ted Lewis, sorry. <laughs> we, we just moved from Chris uh, to Ted. Ted Lewis is uh, coming all the way from Minnesota and um, Ted has been involved also with restorative justice for many, many years, decades now. He's a communications consultant for the Center for Restorative Justice and Peacemaking at the University of Minnesota. Uh, he has worked as a practitioner in the field since 1996. And when I say practitioner, program manager, trainer, teacher, writer, consultant, and supporting community-based nonprofits in many, and government agencies in many parts of the country. Ted is also an ed editor and, and involved with publishing. Um, and, and as you can see in his bio, he's an acquisitions editor for Whip and Stock Publisher, particularly in their Restorative Justice Classics series. Ted also provides prevention-based workshops on servanthood communication and has written numerous articles on conflict fluency through the lens of biblical narrative. So 
to to uh, guests here that um, I think are well qualified and and well positioned to take us in, into this conversation. So I'm going to turn it over to the two of them. But before I do that, just quickly, um, I want to advise everyone who's here. We are trying something slightly different in this particular webinar, and that is that we are also going to provide a follow-up conversation. Many times we're uh, asked by our webinar participants uh, to, to allow space for them to go deeper. So we are experimenting with that, with an extending of the conversation, we're calling it. So there will be a restorative theology follow-up discussion on November 9th, 4.30 to 6 p.m. It will be moderated by Ted and Chris. And we do need you to RSVP. If you want to RSVP right now, uh, you can send, send that through the Q&A uh, space. But in any case, it's an, it's an opportunity for an, another hour and a half uh, to go a little deeper with Ted and Chris. And we'll use um, a, an interactory, uh, a participatory, interactive uh, Zoom uh, process where everyone can have the conversation simultaneously. So we welcome you to that follow-up in extending the conversation if you're particularly um, interested in that. Remember again, as Ted and Chris are moving through their conversation, we invite your questions and uh, we'll take some time, at least 25 minutes at the end to, to entertain some of those questions. So please bring those through the Q&A um, icon that you have at the bottom of your screen. Ted and Chris, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you and we look forward to the conversation. All right, thanks so much, Carl. It's great to partner with EMU on this uh, topic. And I think one of the things that uh, first stimulated uh, this webinar for me was realizing that, that from uh, Chris's more recent book, which, which I'll just put up here, Compassionate Justice, he, he opens by talking about how in, in looking at the parables of the prodigal son and the Good Samaritan, he found that the study of that biblical material could be a lot richer by looking at it through a, a lens of restorative justice, looking at it uh, you know, with the knowledge from various social sciences. But at the same time, he talks about how it's really a two-way street. There's, there's a lot that theologians and biblical scholars can be contributing back into the world of, of legal theory and social science. So that, that idea of a, of a two-way traffic that he maps out in the book really helped me realize that there's a, there's a rich conversation that can happen both ways. Uh, and then certainly with the church uh, practice realm, I consider that to be a, a third partner in, in, this, in this conversation. Maybe, uh, Carl, you can pull up uh, the slide there that shows the three realms. This just uh, gives a picture of how we, we recognize that they operate independently, but there's, there's a lot of overlap in terms of how they're inspiring each other. Uh, some of that has to do with language. Obviously, there's a practice uh, dimension. And um, one of the things I want to clarify for what we mean by church practices, if you want to just go to the next one there, is what well, this, I'm sorry, go one more, Carl. This just points out how church practices have a missional dimension as well as a, a inward communal dimension. And both of them are, are very important, but sometimes when people hear about church practices and restorative justice, they might just think in terms of, well, churches can support victim and offender related programming outside of the church. And we also very much uh, wanna address what does it look like internally to a congregation or, or a community to be having reconciling restorative practices that, that make sure it's a healthy community. Uh, go ahead and back up one slide there. Uh, Johanna already went over these questions as really a way to say this, this is what this webinar is all about. What can stakeholders in each of the three areas be gaining from each other? And we're really excited about the, the Zoom event on November 9th because that's, that's designed to be an informal discussion where we can take these questions and decide in a collaborative way, where do we go next with this? 
where are the spaces for that con conversation? So today's webinar, we're really planning on mapping out these topics. Uh, and then in the follow-up Zoom, which we hope a lot of you can participate in, we, we, we're thinking, what does is, what is the near future really hold? Uh, before we get into uh, some conversation with, with Chris, and I'm going to be asking different questions, I just want to read a quote out of uh, Compassionate uh, Justice. Uh, Chris talks about how there, you know, restorative justice isn't just defined as a process, it's also defined as a set of values. And I'm reading here, if it is to flourish, restorative justice must be anchored in alternative communities of value. That is, in communities of people who accord the highest importance to the values of mutual care and accountability, honesty and compassion, confession and forgiveness, and peacemaking. One such community of value ought to be the Christian church. And just to wind up here, perhaps part of the mission of restorative justice movement is to remind the Christian community of what it supposedly believes and ought to practice more consistently to call the church's attention back to what Jesus himself expounded in his teaching and embodied in his life. And certainly, uh, Chris goes on to develop that realm of teaching in, in terms of the two parables that are most known to us as a way to think about how do we engage victims as in the the story of the product uh the story of the good samaritan how do we engage offenders as we see in the story of the prodigal son so chris i i just want to uh start things off by asking you what first led you to have an interest in this this rich overlap zone between restorative justice and your biblical theological study. Right, well, good morning, Ted. It's morning here anyway. Um, it's nice to ask you, we have 60 people in our, in our uh, seminar, which is, which is wonderful. Um, I first started to explore the overlap after reading Changing Lenses, Howard Zayer's famous book, which I was given in 1991. Um, when I was visiting the US and I read it because I was interested in the chapter on covenant justice. So I'm a New Testament scholar by, by training. I was teaching uh, in a theological college. Uh, I always found um, it important to emphasize the role of peace and the role of justice uh, in, uh, in the Christian tradition. Um, I'd had no interest or no familiarity at all in the criminal justice sphere. So when I, when I read Howard's book, I read it really because I wanted to read the bit about biblical justice that was in that book. But the whole book had a very major impact on me. And I realized that if I was interested in peacemaking and if I was interested in justice in its broadest term, then I had to be interested in criminal justice as well. I mean, the criminal justice sphere is the most violent sphere in, in, um, in modern societies, which are, are at peace anyway. Um, so I read the book and I, I realized that the, the biblical and theological reflection that the book uh, contained was mainly based on Old Testament material and you know, important Old Testament material, but I was a New Testament specialist by background and I, I kind of sensed there was more work to be done uh, in the New Testament sphere. Uh, we invited Howard out to New Zealand in 1994 to speak at a conference. Uh, I didn't invite, I didn't organise a conference, but um, he was invited out. And I was asked to give a, a, a presentation at the conference on what the New Testament had to say about crime and punishment. And I can remember thinking at the time, uh, that won't be a very hard paper to write because as far as I can tell from my sort of scan of the material, the New Testament doesn't have anything to say about crime and punishment. It's all about sin and salvation. Um, it's not really about criminal concerns. Uh, but I discovered when I began to look more closely at the New Testament that there was an, an awful lot of material there, largely neglected um, by New Testament scholarship, but material around prisons and around courts and around uh, policing, around the law, um, and certainly around justice. And all that material, actually, when you started to... Uh, 
you know, to tap into it, there was a rich vein of, of insight there that needed to be fed into the discussion. And so that really was the genesis of, of my interest in this field. And I mean, it's, it's actually ended up, I was going to say, controlling my whole career. It's become, you know, the major focus of, of my work. Um, and I, I have used the image of a dialogue between uh, restorative justice and biblical justice because I think that's a helpful way to think about what we're trying to do when we look at the biblical tradition for insight and for guidance uh, in, in, in doing peacemaking work in the world. Um, it's not a matter of just sort of taking it and transferring it whole as bolus. It's a matter of engaging in a conversation with it and, and finding what's, you know, what's relevant, you know, what needs to be applied in a different way, uh, you know, what we can learn from the tradition, how the tradition can look different if we bring what we know about these questions to it. And so that's really been the focus of my work mm -hmm. is to, to set up that conversation between the two uh, fields of knowledge. And I think hopefully uh, quite richly. I'm wondering if we can identify some of the, the connection points between uh, biblical material and restorative justice. If uh, you want to bring up the next slide. Uh, Chris, talk a bit about where you see the strongest points of connection uh, between biblical theology and restorative justice. I mean, the ones on the slide, I'll make, I'll make a brief comment on each of them, but I guess just the initial point to say would be that the metaphor of changing lenses, which Howard uses for, for thinking about the criminal justice sphere, that it looks different when you use a different framework for approaching the basic problems that the criminal justice sphere. I think that metaphor applies to theological work and biblical work as well, that when you put on this, this new lens of thinking about justice in restorative terms, then everything in the Bible, everything in our, in our tradition looks different. I mean, it looks also very familiar. So this is not to say, you know, we've got it entirely wrong and now we've finally got the right answer to the question. But I think, it, you know, it's a, it's a different way of framing everything we do. So the Bible is, is, is fundamentally about the revelation of God's justice, I think. And if we think of the justice that is revealed in the in the biblical story in restorative terms, then then I think everything looks looks clearer. I mean, that's different's not the right word. It certainly looks crisper. But there are some points of connection. I mean, the first is that the biblical narrative treated as a whole, from Genesis to Revelation, uh, the meta narrative, if you like, is a large story of restoration. So the story opens with. The creation stories, which uh, teach us, I think, what shalom is, what what holistic peace is that God intends for creation, and that shalom in the creation narratives is, is fundamentally the existence of respectful relationships between humanity and God, humanity and creation, and within the human community. Things go wrong. Um, uh, sin enters into the story, and God's response is to hold. Uh, to hold Adam and Eve accountable, naming the harm that's been done, pointing to the consequences, um, some of which are inescapable. Uh, the expulsion from Eden is, is punitive at one sense, but it's clearly for redemptive purposes. And thereafter, God sets about the task of, of restoring and redeeming. Um, you know, the call of Israel, the gift of the law, um, the coming of Christ, uh, all is part of this larger narrative of restoration, pointing towards the final realization of a re renewed creation. So to me, the whole story is a story of restorative justice and action. Um, within that story, there are themes that are very dominant, and I think themes that we can understand more helpfully uh, when we use restorative categories. So the theme of justice, I think, in the Bible is one of the dominant themes, and it's a rich and diverse theme that's multifaceted, there's a rich vocabulary around it. Probably the most important term within that vocabulary is the, is the term for righteousness, because you know, 450 or more times uh, in, the, in the biblical tradition. And the way the Bible speaks about that righteousness is the way restorative justice practitioners speak about justice. It's a relational reality. It's fundamentally about relationships being the way they ought to be. Um, it's, it's active language. It's not this kind of static order that 
needs to somehow be upheld. It's very dynamic. I, mean, I was thinking about this a little bit before today. Retributive justice is very static. I mean, it tries to measure right and wrong against kind of abstract static principles. I think biblical righteousness and restorative theme, ways of understanding justice are much more dynamic. They're much more active. It's about doing what is necessary in order that relationships are right and that they flourish. And I think that's essentially the way the, the Bible speaks about righteousness and certainly about God's righteousness. Uh, atonement theory. I mean, in the biblical story, um, things are fundamentally shifted in a right direction through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And uh, the, the way we understand what God has achieved in Jesus has given rise to a whole diversity of theories of atonement. I don't think there is one theory in the, in the Bible, if you like. There are lots of metaphors for trying to understand uh, the work of Christ. Um, but perhaps the most dominant way it's been understood in recent centuries has been through retributive and punitive categories. That the problem that God faced was the need to punish sin without destroying sinners in the process. And the answer was to punish a substitute and forgive the rest of the community. And I, I think uh, that's a very um, problematic way to understand, I think, atonement. I found, in fact, one of the first things that really struck me as a point of deep resonance between restorative justice and uh, biblical theology was the, the degree to which restorative ways of thinking about the problem and the solution helped me to understand the atonement, helped me to understand what God was doing uh, in Christ through his death and resurrection. I mean, the theme of repentance, forgiveness. Uh, I think repentance is the Bible's word for restorative justice. I mean, the way in which repentance uh, is understood as a matter of you know, contrition and confession and correction uh, and reconciliation. I mean, that's really the restorative dynamic. Um, I've had a discussion recently with people as to whether repentance is now an exclusively religious word or a redundant word. I would like us to hold on to it in the public square because I think um, I think it, it speaks in a very holistic way about what we're trying to achieve through the restorative process. Uh, the theme of forgiveness, uh, I think this is perhaps one of the areas where um, there's going to be a continuing tension between restorative justice and, and, and Christian theology, because I think Jesus' teaching on forgiveness is very radical, um, and I think it challenges even the way in which some restorative justice theorists think about restorative justice and its connection with forgiveness. And then there's this whole eschatological dimension that undergirds the biblical story. Because God's justice is about putting things right. It always has this future kind of orientation. It's always reaching after something in the future. Um, and that's what we mean by eschatology. But the, the good news of the Christian gospel is that that future has already begun to realize itself in an anticipatory way in the present through the work of Christ and through the community that uh, is connected with him. And I mean, I've come to understand um, to think about restorative justice as the kind of you know, first fruits of the kingdom, the kind of the, the eschatological realization, the initial eschatological realization of what God's doing on a larger scale of putting things right. And uh, I think the kind of already not yet tension which Christian theologians in particular are, um, you know, are familiar with as trying to, as a way of interpreting what's going on in the Bible, uh, is a really helpful way of understanding uh, the role of restorative justice within, within the larger justice kind of agenda that um, the human community has. So I think there are lots of, of significant points of contact, but um, these are just some of the more obvious ones. When you drill down, I think, into the whole story, there are many, many rich connections there. Yeah, thanks for that, Chris. So I think one of the things I like about that eschatological dimension is this notion that a restorative process is future-leaning. Uh, there's the theological concept of being proleptic, of, of leaning, leaning into the future. And in my own practitioner work, uh, I often find that there's this shift point where people leave the way to the past and they shift into a discussion toward uh, the future as a way to almost unburden themselves of the past. 
And so yeah. this transition, uh, which leans to the future, is just really part and parcel of a, of a, of a good dialogue process. Yeah. There's uh, other touch points uh, that we could talk about, Carl, if you want to advance one more slide. I've, uh, again, just mo out of my own practitioner experience as a facilitator, mediator, I observe these kinds of things in the dynamics of people coming together. And then it sort of dawned on me, my goodness, these have lots of touch points with the larger biblical context. So certainly the power of storytelling uh, as opposed to fact finding is, is really central to the idea of parties being empowered. And we, we know that there's a preference for storytelling throughout the Bible as, as a vehicle for conveying truth. Dialogue is sacred conversation. Many times I've noticed uh, that parties at the end of a, of a heartfelt conversation will say, this felt like a sacred uh, zone for me to be in. And sometimes people don't want to leave it because it's, it's, it involves such deep healing. Sensitivity to the plight of victims. Uh, the Bible conveys God's preferential treatment of those who are suffering, the oppressed, and this translates very well to making the needs of victims uh, central to a justice process. The humanity and dignity of offenders, uh, the, the adage of separating the sin from the sinner gets, gets worked out very well when offenders are supported, dignified, respected in a, in a process that actually gives them more motivation to be accountable for making amends for apologizing, for not repeating themselves. Uh, this, I think, aligns well with the biblical tradition of, of characters where their weaknesses and sins are out there, and yet they're still heroes of faith for, for what they're doing. And this last one, the paradox of vulnerability leading to life, this, I think, is a real profound connection point between restorative work and, and biblical teaching. I have known, for example, when, when people apologize, I see it as a miniature death. In other words, they have to kind of swallow up some of their pride, they have to swallow some of that reservation to be that open. And when they are able to apologize, it's a great gift to the other person as well as to themselves that leads to new life. And so this pattern of death and resurrection gets played out very well in, in, the, in the dialogue opportunity. Mm. Chris, uh, your work started in the 90s when you, when you started working on the New Testament convergence with restorative justice. I know there's other authors, uh, notably N.T. Wright, for example, who has used uh, a phrase uh, in his recent writings on restorative justice. Carl, if you want to advance the slide. Um, you know, here, here N.T. Wright is saying, God's justice is a saving, healing, restorative justice. Who are, who are other authors that are freely using this language? I mean, that's really what it's coming down to, is this rich common language between the restorative practitioner realm and the theological realm. Just talk a bit about how this language convergence has been unfolding. Yeah, I mean, when, when I worked on Beyond Retribution, which was in the late 90s, I mean, there were a lot of uh, authors that I was reading that said things that um, resonated with, with the theme that I was trying to develop. I, I didn't, I think, come across any who had used restorative justice thinking or restorative justice philosophy, or for that matter, restorative justice language in a kind of comprehensive way for understanding, um, you know, the, the, the story. Uh, but there were, there were many who were, uh, who were speaking about dimensions of the story uh, that could be put together in a more, in a more um, holistic way. So Wright does use in that, I, mean, I remember reading this myself and being struck by the use of the word. From memory, it's just one, one sentence. It's not, he doesn't develop it uh, comprehensively in a, in a restorative justice way. I mean, there are other scholars, um, when I was working on the book, 
I mean, people like Richard Hayes and, and Walter Wink and uh, Stephen Travis did a lot of work around uh, retribution and the problems with retributive ways of understanding justice. Miroslav Volf uses the term restorative justice, although in a slightly anomalous way from memory. Um, you know, Greg Jones, Glenn Starson, um, uh, Donald Shriver, uh, Lee Griffith. I mean, there are a lot of people who would certainly be uh, sympathetic with the kind of uh, uh, attempt to read the biblical story in these categories, but not necessarily having a deep grounding and restorative uh, thinking itself. Um, so I think the language is, uh, you know, is, is, has got a potential that's still, still to be unfolded by scholarship. I mean, Doug Campbell's another New Testament scholar who's, uh, who's using these categories and this experience, uh, Michael Gorman. But I, I think, these voices are still very much in the minority. I don't think this is by any means a mainstream way of trying to make sense of the justice dimension uh, in Christian thought. Um, what, what, what do you think about this? Are there, are there people I've missed? Uh, maybe you said it earlier, um, Darren uh, Belisek, did you mention him? Yes, I didn't mention him, but he's, yes, he's certainly one, yep. Yeah, yeah his, his recent book called Atonement, Justice, and Peace, which came out with Erdman's uh, not too long ago, is, is a major, massive work, actually, on, on bringing these themes together. Yep. Certainly around atonement theology, a very fine work. Yep. One of the things uh, that I think is stimulating this common language is what I call the integrity between the means and the ends, that there is a relationship between how we go about a justice process and the fruit that we want out of that. And this reference to this uh, verse in James, the harvest of righteousness or justice is sown in peace by those who make peace, is a nice uh, touch point that talks about why there needs to be some integrity between uh, means and ends. Mm. Yeah, so that's a great verse, and uh, there there are a number of verses in the New Testament that say things in a really, in a really crisp way about this kind of issue. And it's certainly, I mean, the idea here of uh, of justice being joined at the hip with peace. And these aren't you know these aren't things that stand in tension. These are things that are two sides of the same coin, and peaceable means uh, are needed to achieve peaceful outcomes, and uh, you know just means are needed to achieve just outcomes. Right. Well, I want to uh, transition now toward the, the area of church practices, because when we really think about even the purpose of, of theology, ultimately it's to filter into the realm of practice and application. Not too long ago, uh, Chris, one of your uh, associates, uh, Thomas uh, Noakes Duncan, has written an, an, an important article called The Emergence of Restorative Justice in Ecclesial Practice. This came out uh, just recently in the Journal of Moral Theology. And a few things that uh, uh, Tom notes in this, I'm just reading here, the rapid ascendancy of restorative justice in the mainstream public discourse has been accompanied by a notable lack of continued theological engagement with it in the church. And he's, he's writing this in, in the context of the earlier foundations of restorative justice, which had much more of, a, of an intentional church base. And so anyone who wants to read about what, what could be called the ecclesial or theological foundations of restorative justice as it developed within uh, the mid 70s and early 80s, particularly in the in the VORP or victim offender reconciliation program context, can get a, a a picture of how it had a church base that was pretty strong at the beginning, but then that as it widened out and got mainstream, the church really lost some of its stake in in the work. One of the uh, Articles that Tom quotes within that is something that uh, Ron Clausen and Howard Zare wrote back in, the, in 1989. This was called VORP Organizing, a Foundation in the Church. And they wrote, VORP not only provides an opportunity for the church to be involved in justice making outside itself, but also offers a concrete model for addressing conflict within. 
So they really recognized very well how churches had a certain special calling, a, a responsibility almost to be um, promoting the mission of, of restorative reconciling work, being communities of reconciliation themselves. And yet, uh, you know, Tom points out in his article that the church over time has kind of reneged on this responsibility. Um, and Carl, we can go off the slides here a bit. Or, no, leave, leave that one on. Thank you. Um, Chris, talk a bit about the irony of how restorative justice really owes a lot to the realm of church practice and theology. Uh, but then some of that base has gotten lost over time. And only more recently is there sort of this renewed interest uh, by churches and theologians. Yeah. Yeah. Um... It is an irony. I mean, I think I don't know how to really explain it. Um, I think it's no accident that restorative justice emerged not only out of a Christian um, seedbed, but out of a peace church tradition, out of a tradition that um, saw peacemaking as fundamental to Christian fidelity. I think that's no accident. There's something about restorative justice that, 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 makes most sense when you see it in that sort of context. And as you say, the earliest architects were, were, saw this as a Christian contribution to, to, um, to public life, which hasn't really been taken up as, as widely as, as one would hope. And I don't know why that is, whether it's the fact that, uh, that there hasn't been sufficient theological reflection on it, um, that not enough theologians have seen the relevance of of restorative ways of operating to um, to ex to explain the mission of the church. I, I'm not entirely sure why the church has been slow to recognise its own calling in this. And you know, the, the church, I think, needs to see this not simply as one more thing that can be added to the list of responsibilities it has, but it's something that's fundamental to the very identity of the church. I mean, it's, it's, it's what the church is for. Um, the church exists in order to be the foretaste of the kingdom in the midst of a fallen order, which still affects the church, of course. I mean, it's not, it's not as though we as believers are somehow exempt from the problems of the world around us, but we're supposed to be a community within which the newness of God's um, healing work can begin to be realized in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a more full way than can happen amongst those who don't recognize the story and are not open in the same way to the power of the Spirit. So, I mean, I think it's more than an irony that the church hasn't picked up on this. There's a sort of tragedy about it, really, because I think it reflects a lack of self-awareness of what the church, church's mission, the church's identity, the church's role uh, in, in God's saving work is. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, Howard Zare and Ron Clausen wrote at that time was that the, those warps could be an extension of the church's mission. Mm. Uh, that, that really is the vital calling of, of the church to be uh, agents of shalom, so to speak. Mm. And yet, like you say, part of the irony is that even in the Mennonite church, uh, it's only, you know, when you look at internal practices, there are many Mennonite churches that still look a lot like mainstream churches. They don't have what I call uh, uh, the language of reconciliation internally. And so I think, I think part of what's even motivating this webinar is to try to stimulate new, fresh conversations that can uh, re-engage the church and, and almost claim this, this realm of reconciliation and restoration as vital to its existence. Mm. I think that's right. I, I mean, I think the positive side of all this, and I've always found this in my work uh, in New Testament and, uh, and teaching and, and preaching and so on, is that Christians are actually quite quick to recognize the connections once they're pointed out. You know, it's, 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 it's not like there needs to be a lot of persuasion going on that this really is what Christian identity is all about. It's just being forgotten rather, rather than, I think, resisted. So 
Um, the more that we can show the points of resonance we mentioned earlier, the more that we can explain how this is central to the calling and, and the identity, I mean, not just the activity of the church, but the very identity of the church, uh, I think the quicker Christians will be to recognize it, and, and, and they do recognize it. I mean, there's, uh, I, I guess you find as well that in terms of promoting restorative justice in the wider world, um, I often notice that people will begin by sort of intellectually assenting to the ideas, but then suddenly a penny will drop, and they will say, oh, I, I get it now, you know, I've seen it now. Um, and, and when that happens, it, the, the, the penetration into their thinking and practice is much more profound. I think something similar applies with, uh, with believers as well, that there might be an initial, well, yes, this is helpful, and I can see how this verse might fit with that. But if, if they can get that sudden <laughs> recognition that, that, oh, this is really key to the whole thing, then I think the church has real potential to be um, you know, to be a, a venue for restorative justice in a way that's quite, you know, is quite distinctive. But that potential is slow to be realized, I think, at the moment. So we want to map out some of these uh, practices that uh, fit in both the missional realm as well as the uh, communal realm. In the missional realm, uh, peacemakers, Solidarity with, uh, go ahead and go to the next one. Thank you, Carl. Um, certainly uh, being involved in actual restorative justice programming, but there are some churches that have actual ministries to victims or offenders, uh, maybe visiting prisoners, uh, helping with reentry and reintegration uh, work could be an ex extended ministry of the church, doing racial and historical reconciliation work, is becoming more and more uh, a new horizon for people of faith to be engaging with other other ethnic groups and people groups, indigenous groups. Chris, uh, anything you want to add to this outward focus of practice? Well, I guess you could add anything that serves the interest of of peacemaking and justice in the world. I mean, I think involvement in schools and with young people is really important. I, I think that the, uh, the, the the role of restorative practices in schools is arguably the most important stuff that's going on mm -hmm. because the potential there to, to for, for young people to learn peacemaking ways of dealing with conflict and harm uh, in a way that will affect them for the rest of their lives, I think is, is significant. So I think there's certainly, and I think the connections between churches and schools have a lot of potential for, um, for mutual benefit. Um, I think involvement in, in political advocacy as well is, is important. Um, you know, I think social change always depends upon a convergence of top-down and bottom-up initiatives, and as well as being involved in grassroots work, which I guess is the primary calling of the church, um, Working at political change and policy change and legislative change is also important. And I think uh, you know, the, the church can have a role there as well. Right, lots lots of levels from local to uh, to larger scale. Turning now to uh, inward or communal practices. One of the uh, traditions within certain ch uh, churches is having reconciliation encouraged before communion. Uh, there's some biblical precedent for that, that before you, uh, before you take communion, you have done what you need to do to set things right with, uh, with other members. Uh, the whole realm of confession and relational accountability has a strong base in, in biblical teaching, where we don't go about our formations in a solo fashion, but we do it in relationship with each other. The admonition to forgive one another, along with lots of other uh, one anothering kinds of practices, uh, for bearing one another and being patient with one another, all of that one another language, I think, is is part of both the prevention and the intervention realm of dealing with with problems uh, on a communal level, and that ties in with forbearance as a sin bearing virtue. What does that mean for people in a, in a church community to bear each other's sin in a way that gives life 
that gives encouragement, that gives support, as well as accountability. There's, there's really no tension between healing and accountability when it comes to a restorative process. What else, Chris, do you see uh, that could be named uh, for uh, internal practices? I think the whole ritual dimension is important. I think the, we have within uh, the church some very powerful rituals of, of uh, reconciliation, of forgiveness, of, um, of incorporation, of uh, integration, of being integrated into the body through baptism and so on. Uh, I, I think the, the, the role for seeing the restorative uh, power of such rituals is another area. Um, I have a PhD student who's very interested in the role of ritual and restorative justice, and I think um, uh, in a secular society, we are very bereft of, of rituals that are more than just a handshake or the giving of a certificate. And you compare that to the really embodied rituals of baptism and, and Eucharist and the kiss of peace and those sorts of things. Um, I think if we could see the, the restorative power of those, those rituals, it would be another area. I think another one I just mentioned is around the role of leadership and decision making. Um, I think restorative practices um, depend upon a kind of participatory and uh, egalitarian way of operating as a community. And so I think the, the way in which Christian ministry, Christian leadership operates uh, needs to be restorative. And the way we go about decision making probably needs to be more inclusive uh, than, than it, sometimes it just becomes very bureaucratic. Um, right. And that's, that's a nice segue into our next slide, which, which just shows a variety of dialogue formats. Some of these could be addressing uh, actual incidents uh, to, to intervene, but they can also be used in that prevention realm or decision-making realm that builds uh, healthy, healthy cultures, uh, that sustains groups, because the, the more you do at the front end, the less really you have to do it at the back end. Mm. Uh, Chris, you've talked about this whole notion of culture building, and if, if we want to advance one more slide, I'm wondering if you can talk about, uh, you know, just explain this, this pyramid uh, framework within a church communal, uh, communal setting. Right. Um, I've, I've come to believe that you can't do anything in restorative justice without pyramids. Uh, it all sort of... <laughs> tends to be arranged, uh, uh, sometimes called a sanctioning pyramid um, in the regulatory sphere. Schools often think in terms of pyramids as well. And it's quite a helpful way, I think, just to disentangle some of the elements of what it means to be a restorative community. So this would apply as much to any organization as to the church. But if you think, well, what does it mean for a community to be restorative in a holistic way? Well, the most fundamental part is the kind of culture building part that happens through the nature of the relationships we develop with each other, them being respectful and uh, open and transparent and honest and, and uh, inclusive and, uh, and so on. And so um, this, uh, fundamentally, the church needs to be, a, I guess, a peace culture or, or a restorative culture in all that it does, the way it incorporates children, and, you know, the way it goes about decision-making and so on. Conflicts always arise in the middle of the pyramid. Um, and when conflict arises, we need to have developed the virtues and disciplines of addressing conflict in a restorative way. And, you know, churches don't do conflict well. I mean, whether they do it any worse than anybody else, I guess, is a question, but I don't think they do it any better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of it is a skill issue. I mean, the, 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 there might be a, a kind of deep recognition that conflict ought to be addressed in a positive way, but... Um, to do that, you need skills, you need, you need processes, you need some language, you need some ways of, of raising problematic issues that aren't uh, fuel, or fuel to the fire. And so I think within the church community, we probably need to do a lot more teaching around, around conflict management. And by conflict there, I mean where you know, both sides have contributed to the, to, the, to the broken relationship. But then there are episodes where there's been clear wrongdoing on the part of one party. Uh, where a disciplinary process uh, is appropriate. And this is really hard in the modern church because modern churches are voluntary communities. And if people feel that they've, they're going to have a hard time, they simply leave. And so the, the, the ability of the, of the church to 
do discipline in a restorative way is, you know, is, is a real issue, I think. Um, in the earliest church, uh, the church was such an important community of identity that to, 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 to expel a person was a major disciplinary measure. Uh, and, and beyond retribution, I look at all those texts which speak of, of uh, this expulsion and, and suggest that it was nearly always intended for redemptive purposes, for ultimately to reintegrate the person. But I think within, uh, within church discipline, and the areas where, of course, this has become most controversial and has, you know, has brought the church into most disrepute is around the area of sexual assault and the tendency of churches to want to just sweep it under the carpet or to, to not deal with it in a thoroughly restorative way. So I think if, you know, this is just, I mean, it's just one way of, of trying to disentangle, the, the, I think, the three major strands of being a restorative community. Um, and think about what would be involved in, in each of these areas, just as a way of organizing our, our thinking. Yeah, great. I like to think uh, that, that churches can foster cultures of apology, uh, where people are schooled into uh, the, the making that a normal thing as opposed to something that rarely happens. And the more that's modeled, to, to children and youth, uh, then they grow into that culture of apologizing. And, and really, that's a, that's a counterpoint to relational forgiveness as well. Mm, mm. Well, I think we're, we're nearing our, our end time. Um, we can go off the slides, Carl. Uh, Chris, one of the things I guess I, I want to talk to you uh, before we wind up here is are there some persistent barriers of resistance in both the church and theological worlds that, that are preventing what we're really inviting here, a greater convergence with restorative uh, justice as a, as a framework for, for doing theology, for informing church practices? Uh, where, where are those barriers if, if they are there? Yeah, again, I, another question I don't really know how to answer very, very profoundly. Um, I mean, I think the reality is one of mutual, a lack of mutual recognition. I think that, um, you know, in the public sphere, the public sector, a lot of talk these days about overcoming silos. And I think to some extent, the Christian community and the wider restorative justice community are, are, are silos. Uh, there are lots of individuals who participate in both, and I think that's a really important point of contact. There are a lot of practitioners who come from a faith background, even if it's quite remote. Um, so there are people who bridge both worlds, but there aren't many uh, leaders or thinkers or, or, or um, theologians particularly who bridge both worlds, and I think that's, that, that's a problem. Um, I think in the theological world and the, in the world of Christian leadership, the, the discovery of, of the power of restorative categories for making sense of the faith and, and helping the community to live faithfully uh, isn't being made by very many people. And I think that's a barrier. And then on the, on the restorative justice side, and this is probably putting it a bit too strongly, but it sometimes feels like restorative justice has been hijacked by criminology and it's become a crime control method. And sometimes we sell it to, to governments as a crime control method. And uh, there's a tendency when we do that to strip away some of these deeper sort of wellsprings of practice and insight that, that the, 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 you know, the theological tradition can offer. So uh, to me, that's the biggest barrier. I, I think we need more people to have these kind of conversations that we're having now to, to sort of to try and um, encourage mutual recognition between the two discourses because the power of doing so, I think, is immense and the potential that could be unleashed by having these communities of restoration is present working in the world, I think, is, is, is huge. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and again, we're kind of back to where we started with this idea of a, of a street with two-way traffic. Yeah. Um, the, you know, theologians have so much to gain, I think, if they can be hearing the actual narratives of, of restorative dialogue uh, resolution processes. And mm. That's going to enrich their categories, their language. And at the same time, uh, you're making a case, Chris, that people within uh, the social science realm, people who are doing uh, legal theory, uh, philosophy, 
really have a lot to gain if, if they can hear fresh, uh, fresh studies within the biblical theological realm. And then thirdly, we're really making a case that the church can gain from all of this by having uh, a new language for, for practices that people can get schooled into and the church starts to live out a witness of, of recon reconciliation by, by the way it operates. Well said, yep. Well, I think we're, uh, Carl, uh, Johanna, we're at a, a turning point. Maybe you have some reflections uh, that you want to make before we go into a, a chat time. Sure, thank you. And Joanna, I'll, I'll let you make any inputs you might want to at this point, um, or, or we can go into the questions. I really appreciate the, the discussion here. I think it's, it's a very important um, discussion, as, as both of you have mentioned and highlighted. We definitely need more dialogue in this area. And, you know, I think one of the, the components that um, is, is most exciting to me when we talk about, or one of the areas is most exciting to me when we talk about uh, restorative justice and the role that churches can play. Um, one is um, so much, so many restorative justice programs, uh, practice is either, as you kind of mentioned, just with the co-optation in the government, is either connected to governmental institutions or it's connected to nonprofit organizations. And so we have on one hand, this kind of problem with co-optation. And then the other hand, in terms of nonprofits, one of the main issues is sustainability. And so when we think about institutions that exist that are really have already mechanisms for sustainability and also are deeply rooted in faith and you know um, values, it's churches. So I think in terms of being able to create really sustainable ways of integrating restorative justice in communities, uh, especially communities that are marginalized, especially communities that are economically, you know, um, really under under resourced. The church is really our, our most viable um, mechanism for doing that in my in my perspective. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, the church, in fact, or faith-based networks really are the envy of of civil society and and if we if we could find ways to begin to harness the sense of the church's role in society uh, in this area i think it would be in, it, it would be it would be worth our energy uh, to continue to think about how do we grow that as a as a network as a movement i wanted to say also what was striking me i think you know, around the history of the church and how restorative justice sort of grew out of, uh, of faith communities and then has had this um, back and forth relationship in different ways with the church. My sense is with this generation, if we want to, um, that's controversial, what is this generation? But the millennial, look, there's a callback for a whole new way of looking at, 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 at justice. And I think this is where and it's far beyond um, certain uh, peace tr church traditions or Mennonite groupings. Now, this is um, this call for justice is is a is a is a broader call, and and restorative justice is filling that. As as this generation says, the institutions that came before us just aren't doing this anymore. In fact, they're working against us, and we want to find another way to reconfigure how we understand justice and how we see justice. And so, I I think there we're on a run a wave of that conversation, which is what makes this a very salient moment to be talking about these things. Mm -hmm. And I think the church needs to step into that, that public platform and, and that public space in ways that it has not before. And I think that's part of our struggle is figuring out how to do that with confidence. Mm -hmm. Let's go to some of the questions here because we've got some great ones here and I wanna give some chance to hear from those who've been, who've been in uh, part of this conversation. Uh, one question here, is RJ, like many church programs, essentially to be called upon after disaster or injustice has occur occurred, or does it contribute significantly to preventing injustice? So we're talking about prevention here, to defending the public peace from oppression by the armed, powerful, violent in the first place. So really at that key of, of prevention. And, 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 a res and sort of asking for us to respond to this idea that restorative justice is only reactive or responsive when, when a violation has occurred. And, and I'm happy for 
Chris, Ted, anyone to jump in on that? Yeah, I, I certainly appreciate that question. I'll say just a tiny bit and someone else can add on to it. I think uh, when you look at the last 40 years, certainly the, the program side of restorative justice is reactive to criminal incidents and providing an alternative way to deal with them. But as it's grown and as people have wanted to deal with things holistically and dealing with causes and root issues and community issues, the prevention realm has, has become a larger domain of restorative justice and, and where you really see this well in the last two, three years with, with racial, with race relation tensions, even in our own nation, a lot of the discussion around where can restorative dialogue be helpful is directly in that prevention realm. You know, how can police and community members be coming together to have dialogue? Uh, how, how can neighborhoods be doing things that are, are community justice oriented that prevent other crimes. So I think there is a broadening out. Uh, at the same time, uh, no one is going to want to let go of, of dialogue as a central component of what, what defines this work. So I'm, I'm just going to jump in here. The, the same respondent said uh, there's another way he could word this question too. What do theology and RJ say about how to deal with an enemy, quote unquote, before they have aggressed? About how one should structure one's relationship to one's potential mm -hmm. or actual oppressor in order to prevent or stop it. So that was another way in which they were coming at this question. So I don't know if Chris or Joanna want to jump in on that. Um, yeah, I guess uh, there are two sides to prevention. One side is preventing harm that has occurred from reoccurring. So most, most crime is repeat crime. So the more that a restorative process can prevent the people who have either been victimized or have caused a crime to, to uh, re-offend, then that's a significant preventive dimension. The other side of prevention is, is um, as Ted said, is building the ability to hold conversations around things that will lead to harmful behaviors occurring, um, to hold those conversations in a, in a peaceful way. And I guess that what the, what the questioner is suggesting is that within the, the, the Christian tradition of love of enemy, there is a kind of stance towards those who might cause us harm that is peacemaking at the outset. And, um, and I guess that, how, how does that work out in practice? I, I suppose it's a way of, of helping uh, faith communities to think of those who are responsible <coughs> for um, oppressive actions or harmful actions to think of them as uh, not as somebody to be um, overcome, but as, as somebody to be engaged with in a way that is nonviolent, but is still concerned with issues of, of oppression and justice. Um, there was, a, many of you may have read a, a very interesting um, restorative process that happened at Dalhousie University in Canada around a, a Facebook group which had become very um, very offensive towards members of female members of the class and one of the conditions of involving a restorative or using a restorative process to address this significant harm was that the process had to talk about the cultural dimensions out of which this sort of cyber bullying and, 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 and misogyny had arisen. So I think within restorative practice, we need to look for opportunities to address the, the causes and the cultural conditions that have given rise to the harm and not be content with just dealing with the individual episode that's occurred. And that, that, that's preventive, I think, ultimately. I'm going to take two here that are on a similar vein, and I think... Um one, one is, I'd love to hear more about the slide on outward practices, particularly racial and historical healing. And if I can couple with that, are there successful examples of churches using restorative justice techniques on their anti-racism efforts internally or, and or externally? And I'd just like to add actually a, a bit to that question as well. I think um, your, the question was, around kind of hearing more about particularly racial and historical healing 
but also what are some of the key leaders um, and organizations, especially within churches that are doing work in this area? Well, one of the one of the areas that I think is is exciting in terms of dealing with uh, Native American indigenous historical harms has been up in Canada. Uh, Elaine Enns, uh, who's been involved with restorative work all the way back to the 80s, um, has been involved with uh, some projects where there's listening and, and healing opportunities that bridge uh, Mennonite church groups. Uh, you know, who have settler ancestry in the Plains area of, of Canada uh, with Native American stakeholders. And so having those kinds of, of forums for, for healing discussion, I think, is, is one nice example of that. In New Zealand, I mean, we've been involved in a, in a process of trying to deal with um, historical harms to Indigenous people uh, for the last 30 or so years around um, uh, around storytelling and, and restitution and, and, and settlement. Um, and churches have, have done work on these issues in terms of their own story. So the Anglican Church in New Zealand, for example, has restructured itself entirely uh, to reflect the the, the, the foundational principle of the treaty on which New Zealand was founded of, of partnership between indigenous and settler communities. Uh, and I think most, most denominations have done that kind of work. Uh, whether they've done it out of a clear understanding of restorative processes, I'm not sure. Um, I think, again, a restorative way of thinking about what's going on would probably be very helpful in terms of clarifying the importance of storytelling and accountability and repair and reconciliation and so on. Um, I think in New Zealand, in the public sphere, the language of settlement has been very strong, uh, not so much the language of reconciliation. Um, and I think, again, this is where churches perhaps have a, have a, have a, a vocabulary to offer that would reinforce what's going on at a public level as well. What just I just want to add one more thing. Part of the reason we want to have the Zoom event on November 9th is to brainstorm practical ways where obviously the discussions can happen. We can create spaces for discussion, but also how the information, such as banking uh, examples of church based reconciliation efforts, how can we bank that information in a place that's more accessible? And so those, those are the practical kinds of ideas we're hoping will, will be born out of our next uh, November 9th discussion. Yeah, I mean, Ted, Ted and I have talked about the, uh, the need for a book um, on churches as restorative communities that would, would spell out the kind of theory of what it means to be a restorative community we've talked about already, but would also have, have case studies of, of what different congregations and different traditions are doing um, in, in this kind of restorative way, I think that would be a really useful resource to, to have. One, one just final thing I want to add to that is it's, it is noble, but it's also easy for churches to get excited about an outward practice focus. But if they don't parallel that with an internal set of practices where they're dealing with their own internal relationships in a restorative way, in my perspective, it, it'll ultimately lack a certain kind of integrity as they do that outward mission. Mm -hmm. And so there really needs to be a, a commitment for both uh, the outward and the inward being done in parallel. Mm -hmm. mm. That's, a, that's a great point. And I just wanted to, to add on to what you're saying, Ted, about you know the, the question around racial reconciliation and racial healing going on within churches and the people doing that work, many of the people who are doing that work don't just see it as an outward um, mission, but something that they're doing inwardly. So we're addressing the need for racial healing and racial reconciliation within our churches. Mm -hmm. And that connects to um, racial justice and healing and reconciliation outside of churches. And there's a few people that I can think of who are, um, who I look to, um, as uh, really helpful. Uh, Brenda Salter-McNeil is one. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, another person, uh, Drew Hart, who has a lot of kind of writing around the church and racism. Mm -hmm. And another person, uh, Christina Cleveland, also, mm -hmm. who's a social psychologist and really uh, actually takes a very uh, interesting, um, basically is connecting reconciliation and social and looking at insights from social psychology so what do these insights tell us about why we're so disconnected particularly in relation to race as well as class and then what can we learn about how to bridge those gaps using these insights from social psychology um they're, they're, they're all african-american scholars thinkers practitioners um and so they've been really helpful to me and they've also uh, actually just um uh this past fall christina cleveland was here and she'll be back here at EMU in January at our mm -hmm. School for Leadership Institute, which is sponsored by our seminary. And Drew Hart will be one of the speakers here as well. And uh, Drew Hart's out of um, Messiah College now in Pennsylvania. And uh, Dr. Cleveland, Christine Cleveland's out of Duke, Duke University, the theology school there. Let me just jump in with um, another question. I think it's really important and urgent in this time. There's lots of discussion happening in many, many parts of our society around this. Um, I am working with faith organizations response to child sexual abuse. And there has been thinking about what a theology of apology might look like. As I'm specifically working in the context of the Catholic church, I have an example of the ritual of confession as a contrast with a potential ritual of relational justice, of making things right between a victim and offender. I'm wondering if Chris could speak a bit more about what restorative theology might say about how churches should approach victims of child sexual abuse and how practice might inform a ritual. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> I guess the, the two most challenging areas for restorative practices, the area of, of family violence and the area of, of sexual offending, um, you know, both areas of gendered violence and their complex power dynamics and, and, uh, and often a history of abuse that needs to be addressed. And as I said before, I don't think the church has covered itself in glory uh, in the way it's ad addressed this. And, and partly, I, I think, at a, again, at a skills level, um, a danger of feeling that all that's needed is an apology, a confession, and a kind of an act of, of remission. I think restorative practice offers us a much fuller and profounder understanding of what apology means. Um, and I've, I've been a bit of reading around apology recently, actually, and the, when you look at it in its fullest sense, again, it's, it's another way of talking about the whole restorative process that involves contrition and confession and, and, and restitution and repair and accountability and all those sorts of features. And I guess these have to be, um, have to be employed when we're dealing with something as, as complex as historic childhood abuse. Uh, I guess in some occasions there would be the possibility of, of this process occurring between the, the person who's perpetrated the abuse and the victim. I mean, often that's not possible because the perpetrator may not be still around or not willing to admit to the wrongdoing. And perhaps we need to be creative there around processes that are restorative for victims, but don't depend upon uh, an encounter with the perpetrator. Um, and I, I, you know, I, th I think there are, there, are, there are clear ways in which that could happen helpfully so that victims can deal with the legacy of, of, uh, of their harm, even if the perpetrator is not available. Mm -hmm. But I think it does require a skillful way of approach and, and um, uh, again, it's where, I guess it's where our tradition and our language can be something that trips us up because we think we know what's needed and you know, what's needed is confession and absolution, but uh, we need a, a richer, more restorative way of thinking about, about repentance or, or, or apology. Mm -hmm. And I would just add to that 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 those realms of incidents are are important to probably have someone outside the church partner with the church who has either professional or re restorative facilitative skills so that they can customize a process that really fits with with the participants. And the language that I like to use is that congregations need to journey with people, whether they've been offended against or whether they are the offender, they need to find ways to journey with them. That's much more important than, than bringing those parties together. 
Um, and in most cases, it's probably not even appropriate to bring them together. But, but there can be other kinds of dialogue opportunities that bring long-term accountability and long-term healing as you journey with people, discern their needs, and, and that, that I think is a really important perspective in the area of sexual offending. And I think, um, let me just grab a few here. Maybe, um, another question that's just come in with agreement with what was just said, still um, um, a question sort of floating around, uh, how could a theology of restorative justice help Ta-Nehisi Coates own his own body? Does our notion of justice include that the oppressed regain some control over their own fate? Well, there's, there's the notion of empowerment in restorative justice. Uh, when, when you create safe zones for people to name their needs, to give voice to their story, uh, to be active in their request, that's an empowerment model. And I think where that fits theologically is that ultimately uh, God, through biblical rev revelation, has used invitational, non-coercive, uh, styles of communicating and inviting people into zones of either formation or healing. And he, even the ministry of Jesus can be pretty, pretty much separated into a zone of, of healing people who have been victimized and helping people in formation where they need to grow and, and be held personally accountable to their own growth issues. And so I, I think there's a lot of theological um, richness that that can be articulated better than, I, than I'm doing it right now. There's more work to be done, but that fits with this idea of, of empowerment through invitational means. And, and I wonder too how much we have um, developed enough of a theology about truth-telling and its place in, in the church and, and in our theological frame. And, and, you know, what does it mean to um, engage in, in truth-telling uh, in, in a very deep way, in a hard way? And I think we've seen some great examples, again, back to, for instance, the, the Greensboro Truth and Reconciliation Commission right here in, in, in our country, in North Carolina, the first one, had a civil society uh, involvement for sure, but a lot of faith communities were also deeply engaged in that process. And I think... The church, in order to become a legitimate actor in this process, is going to need to be able to also engage in that truth-telling process and acknowledge that as a stepping stone in the restorative justice um, process or movement. I agree with that. I, I don't know whether this is a relevant comment or not to, to what the questioner is driving at, but I found it very helpful in my thinking to think of restorative justice as making relationships right not necessarily reconciling in the sense of, of recreating the relationship as a close relationship. But, and I think this way I understand one of the contributions of Paul's theology of justification by faith is that it's a matter of making the relationship right again. And part of that rightness is having control over one's body, which was, you know, which was mentioned in the question. It's having one's autonomy, one's dignity, one's value uh, acknowledged and respected. Uh, that's part of what a right relationship involves. It's not necessarily about the relationship being restored to a position of intimacy, which sometimes is not appropriate and sometimes is not possible. But the relationship, I think, can always be righted by the, the wrongs that have been done, being exposed, being talked about fully, as you've said, Carl, the full truth-telling, uh, not just the kind of punct punctilia confession, but the, the telling of the story, uh, and of all people, Christians ought to know the importance of storytelling because our whole faith depends upon it. Um, the acknowledgement of the wrong, the, the, aff the, the affirmation of the needs of the, of the victim, the, the, you know, the, the, the sense of vindication, all that can occur even if the relationship itself is not reconciled in, in a kind of mutual way. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I don't know whether that's helpful or not, but I, I think it, it is important because some of the resistance to restorative justice that we encounter is, especially in the family violence area, 
is suggesting that it depends upon the, the participants once again having a close, intimate relationship with each other. And I think that's not what we're about. It's about them having a right relationship with each other, a relationship based on dignity and respect and safety and, and, and acknowledgement and so on. There's Wonderful. A, I just want to add one uh, book uh, by a Japanese theologian. It's called The Pain of God. And uh, the author name is slipping me right now, but that's a, that's a good example of talking uh, of a theological approach to God's solidarity with those who are victimized. And if you, if you find that book, it is uh, translated into English. Uh, that's an example of a theological development of solidarity. Wonderful. Well, we're close to closing up now, and I want to say a big thank you to uh, Ted Lewis and Chris Marshall. Thank you for your time and for stimulating this conversation in, in some really important ways. And I hope we have already had, at least I've caught at least six people RSVP, and I'm sure there'll be some more for the November 9th follow-up to go a little bit more deeper in these subject matters. So thank you all, and um, I'm... Uh, uh, going to turn this over to Sarah then to take us into the final bit of uh, our conversation. One thing uh, before we go to Sarah that I wanted to mention, many people asked about um, networking. There was a, so many people on the webinar today who are interested in this topic and many of you were asking, is there some way that we can share our information with one another? So we have created a Google document so that you can add your information as well as um, view others information because we're not able to share to share that information that you've given us. But if you'd like to, we've posted that in the chat window um, as well as in the Q&A, the questions asked so that you can go to tinyurl.com slash restorative theology network, just as a way that um, even whether you are or not participating in the webinar, if you want to share your information with others and access the information, that's one way that you can do that. All right. Thank you. I really you. appreciate that. Thank you all. Yeah. Sarah? Yes. All right. Um, so as Carl mentioned, my name is Sarah. Um, last name is King, and I'm a graduate student at the Center for Justice and Peacebuilding in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Um, I work as a graduate assistant here for the Zare Institute, and I have a couple of announcements to share with all of you. So we're going to get to those straight away. So just as another reminder, um, as mentioned previously, there will be a follow-up conversation from this webinar this evening. Um, it will be held on November 9th at 4.30 Eastern Standard Time. Um, I'm sorry, the conversation will be conducted online via Zoom, so the same platform we're using right now, and it will be limited to 25 participants. Um, hosted by Chris Marshall and Ted Lewis, and please, I, I have received one, two, three, four, five, six, um, six RSVPs from people who are watching right now. Um, I do encourage you, though, to just RSVP to RSVP directly to TED. That would be that would be very helpful um, by October nineteenth to register. In terms of the rest of our rest of our webinar series, um, we have two more coming up. The next is on November second, and looking at um, the failings of the criminal justice system and a victim's efforts to heal. Johanna will be hosting that event, and then the one following, which will be the last one for our fall series, is about restorative justice and the practice of law on December sixth, hosted by Howard Zare. And then I know summer seems far away, but it's not too early to sign up for the Center for Justice and Peace Building's Summer Peace Building Institute um, for next summer 2017. SPI is a four week intensive during May and June, offering 20 different courses. If you're interested in taking an intensive course on restorative justice, there are a few options here on the screen. Um, and then there are also, there, I think there are over 20 classes that are offered during SPI. So feel free to go online and look up those and see what the options are and to register if you are so moved. Um, for announcements for STAR, STAR is Strategies for Trauma Awareness and Resilience. It is a research-based training program that brings together theory and practice from neurobiology, conflict transformation, human security, spirituality, and restorative justice to address the needs of trauma-impacted individuals and communities. This program is great for individuals and organizations whose work brings them into contact with populations dealing with current or historic trauma. There are several opportunities to receive STAR training within the U.S. Um, most of them are at EMU, but there's also an opportunity at Hamlin University coming up next weekend. Um, 
in Minneapolis and then one in Pennsylvania, and I think that's it. And then we also have a new option, um, STAR for pre-K through 12 educators, which I believe Kathy Evans was on the webinar this evening as, a, as someone who is watching, and I think she'll be involved with that. Um, so next we have the Graduate Certificate in Restorative Justice. And this is certificate is for 18 credit hours with equal focus given to conflict analysis and practice, restorative justice studies and electives, which could focus on any number of things, um, psychosocial trauma, monitoring evaluation, whatever you might like. The certificate can be completed through a number of courses offered through the annual Summer Peace Play Institute or through a combination of one semester on campus and one summer term. If you're interested in restorative justice and education, um, there is a master's program here. Um, I'm sorry, let me find my notes again. Okay, so a master's in education with a restorative justice and education concentration, or there's also a 15 hour graduate certificate in restorative justice and education. So you have a few different options there if you're working in school settings and would like to do restorative justice there. And then we have our master's in conflict transformation and we also have a brand new master's in restorative justice, which is very exciting. And more information can be found on this slide and then also going to the EMU webpage, I think we now have um, the restorative justice MA section all filled out for people who are interested in that. And last but not least, the Zare Institute website is up and going and beautiful and we do um, publish all of the webinars. They will be uploaded to YouTube, but then we also have a section where previous um, webinars are uploaded so that you can watch. It's just directly linked to YouTube. So you can find any past videos that you'd like to watch and then get notified for events that are coming up. So that concludes my announcements and here are Carl and Johanna again with any closing comments that they might have. Thank you. I just want to thank everyone for coming out for this conversation. It's been a real pleasure to see the numbers. And um, so thank you for uh, participating so actively in this conversation. And I do hope many of you will join for the November 9th event. Agreed. Thank you all once again. Thank you to our special guests. And stay posted for uh, more offerings that we'll have at the intersections of these topics. This um, conversation that we're having now and the conversation that Ted Lewison and, and Christopher Marshall are, are offering will not be the last time we explore this topic. So definitely just stay tuned for, for more discussion, more opportunities to engage. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. <laughs>